Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for Flash Forward, Where Might You Be After Adopting a Social Determinants of Health Insight Discipline, presented by LexisNexis. I am Mary DeCelia, event moderator, and on behalf of LexisNexis, I welcome you to today's program. Before we launch into the main presentation, I would like to go over a few brief housekeeping items. First, today's event will be about an hour long and is being recorded. We will email you a link to the on-demand recording so you can view the presentation again later if you like or share it with a colleague. Please disable your pop-up blocker to ensure you have no trouble viewing the slides or links in today's web event. This is an interactive event. Feel free to submit questions to our speakers using the Q&A box on your screen. We also encourage you to tweet throughout the event use the handle at Lexus Healthcare. If you would like to enlarge the slides, you may do so by dragging the corner of the box. This function allows you to make them bigger or smaller. Please take a moment to visit our resource center. The box is on your console. Here you can access resources that might be helpful. If you have any technical difficulties during the webinar that I have not covered, press Control plus F5 to refresh your screen. If that does not work, please feel free to reach out using the Q&A box. And finally, at the end of this event, we will present you with a survey. Please take a moment to complete the survey to let us know your thoughts on today's event. Now I would like to introduce today's featured speakers. First, we have Erin Benson, Director of Market Planning for LexisNexis. Her focus is on the development and execution of strategic planning for member identity and socioeconomic determinants of health solutions. Prior to joining LexisNexis, Ms. Benson was a senior consultant at Deloitte Consulting. She holds a bachelor's and master's degree in human and organizational development from Vanderbilt University and an MBA in strategy and management from Duke University, the Fuqua School of Business. Our second speaker is Eric McCulley, Director Strategic Solutions Consultant. With nearly 20 years experience, Eric started his career in healthcare as a nurse administrator in cardiology, endocrinology, and intensive care for several years. Eric continued to grow his healthcare industry experience through various sales, marketing, and operational leadership experiences in the pharmaceutical and biologics industries and health care consulting space. Most recently, Eric has led healthcare data and analytics solutions within the payer, provider government, pharmaceutical, and life science industries. In his current role, Eric enjoys leading a team of identity solutions architects at LexisNexis. With a deep subject matter expertise specific to our member and patient identity solutions, including our social determinants of health solutions. Eric graduated from Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska with a BSN and RN license. With all that said, I will pass the presentation to Ms. Benson. Erin? Thank you, Mary, and welcome, everyone. I will hope you find today's content informative and helpful, but perhaps most importantly, thought-provoking. Both Eric and I are committed to empowering the healthcare community with approaches that both support improved effectiveness and nurture innovation. We hope that today's session will lead to continued conversations and our direct contact information will be provided at the end. For this session, we seek to provide insight in responding to the question, where might you be after adopting a social determinants of health discipline? As we continue our discussion, we encourage you to not only take in the information, but also view it through the lens of what could have been. Where might your organization be today had you begun utilizing social determinants of health a year ago? If you have already started utilizing them, we aim to provide you with ideas for utilizing them further. If you haven't been utilizing them, we hope today will provide you with some helpful perspective on how to get started. Today's session is really all about driving a focus on earlier and more effective health dialogues with members that factor in a wide spectrum of life seemingly unrelated circumstances, but which actually serve as an early healthcare warning system. We will kick off by putting a bit of perspective around the world of change both providers and health plans are facing in 2017. While social determinants have always impacted health, it is these changing trends that have become a, that have shown a bright spotlight on the need for healthcare organizations to address member health holistically. We'll then level set definitions within social determinants of health. 
From there, we will share the importance of arriving at health attributes that are clinically validated and how best to operationalize these attributes into member outreach via scoring. As we wrap up, we will provide high-level recommendations for getting started with social determinants of health or spark ideas for new ways of utilizing the data. Please post your questions as we go along, and we'll get to as many as possible toward the end of the hour. To get us started, let's first discuss key trends that are driving our attention and changing the healthcare landscape dialogue. Eric, what can you tell us? Thanks, Aaron. Well, Aaron and I and many of our colleagues, we've been actively discussing and exploring ways to really address the challenges and opportunities related to healthcare, uh, particularly quality, cost, and experience. Uh, in the last 12 or 18 months, uh, no matter the venue, the participants, or the agenda, it seems that there are seven fairly common challenges within our landscapes um, that are supported by federal and state mandates that keep capturing our attention. So let's talk a little bit about these seven initiatives. So I've put individual member engagement and consumerism at the top of this list. As all of you know, this really refers to the ability to better align information to services and actively focus on the needs of the consumer uh, as they access these healthcare services. This is an overall recognition within the healthcare delivery continuum that the more member specific you can make your communications and respective programs and services, that there's a higher likelihood that those members will become truly engaged in their health and ideally adopt a healthier lifestyle. The second is evolving care payment models and most of you, again, know that, that these continue to dominate the landscape and have really been the most disruptive to the current business models and practices that you have in place, although there's no real turning away from these as they are a necessity in achieving quality and reimbursement metrics. These approaches uh, relative to payment and reimbursement uh, that are driving these, uh, these needs to improve outcomes and results associated with care rather than continuing payment for service regardless of outcomes is often referred to today as the shift from fee for service to fee for value or value based reimbursement uh, strategies. Third is the evolving care um, uh, and delivery models that are permeating the healthcare landscape today. These new organizational structures for the delivery of healthcare that are often directed at improving care quality, care coordination, and results, and even include risk sharing in the provider spaces today. These are significant enough, but intersecting with these are really four additional issues that continue to compound these discussions. I'm sure many of you are beginning to integrate personal, mental, and behavioral health views into what is currently the patient view that you consider today in your risk stratification and care continuum models. Uh, this continues to dominate the landscape and creates the need for more robust and more comprehensive data solutions to help create these 360 degree views. Fifth is summarizing potentially avoidable healthcare conditions. This isn't necessarily a new concept as preventative medicine has dictated the literature um, uh, for for years and years, but it's a recognition that much of what we do continues to be reactive in nature, uh, and we continue to shift to how can we better engage our membership to be more proactive in preventing um, the conditions from occurring in the first place, or at a minimum preventing the worsening of the chronic conditions that we're faced with treating uh, every single day. Six is the overall health system performance, uh, and it's being scrutinized to ensure that the right medical care is delivered in the right way to the right members at the right time. Uh, this sounds like a platitude, I think, to most of us. However, it continues to be what shapes how we continue to evolve our engagement and ultimately our healthcare delivery practices. And then finally, uh, all of the attention around these new and evolving data sources continues to underscore the need um, to not only acquire these data, but continues to provide direction on how we secure this data and protect this data um, and the identity and the healthcare records of all of our, of our members uh, that, that we serve. The interconnectivity of all of these disciplines really demands data insight across the entire continuum of the healthcare's operational model, and we believe that the social determinants of health are going to continue to grow and play a more pivotal role. So as the title of this session states, 
we are really looking to answer the question, where might you be after adopting a social determinant of health insight discipline? Well, let's consider three metrics to arrive at an answer. First, and perhaps foremost, is the quality of the healthcare outcomes. Social factors account for 33% of total deaths in the U.S. each year. 50% of overall health is influenced strongly by social, economic, and environmental factors. And this data is substantiated by findings in, uh, from Kaiser Permanente. Second is financial risk. The American Medical Association has stated that 25% of the healthcare spend today treats diseases and or disabilities that result from potentially changeable behaviors. And lastly, retention. 10% of commercially insured individuals change their payers every single year, and 2.5% actually leave their commercial plans annually. These reasons include changes in employer plan offerings as well as seeking less expensive plans. This really speaks to the consumerism that I referred to earlier. But given these facts, these three factors, something beyond the traditional approach to member engagement and care certainly is needed. The reality is this, is that many payers are trying to re-engineer their respective business models to achieve sustainability around proactive engagement to create motivated membership that ultimately drives better quality and better care. These concepts really are not new, but what is new is that the social determinants of health uh, are beginning to shift this reactiveness to a more proactive and more comprehensive patient view to help enhance and help you achieve financial stability. Dr. Donald Schwartz of the Robert Wood Foundation said, we need to think upstream and differently so we can improve health rather than just improve upon the problems. In this context, upstream really refers, refers to the opportunity to make a difference at a different stage. So here's a hypothetical. If we were to focus on socioeconomic and environmental conditions at individual member levels, can we make a difference via reduced complications, reduced costs, or even reduced diagnostic severity? If we could, that these changes no doubt would make a significant impact on our ability to reduce costs, improve health outcomes, and increase member retention, all of which are critically important, I am sure, in your respective strategies. So Erin, given these trends, where do we go from here? Thanks, Eric. Given the background you've provided on the shifting needs of the healthcare market, the next logical question is, what should payers and other healthcare organizations do to adjust to and stay ahead of market trends? Each of us lead lives that are influenced by social, economic, and environmental factors every day. The World Health Organization says these factors are called social determinants of health, which are conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age that impact their health. But before we provide our perspective and knowledge about social determinants of health, I'd like to understand where everyone on the call has been getting their information. This leads us to our first polling question. The question is, what has been your primary means of learning about social determinants of health? The options are webinars and conferences, research studies, white papers and articles, first-hand experience utilizing social determinants, more than one of the above or none of the above. I know this has been a really popular year for social determinants, so there's been a lot of webinars like the one we're doing today in research studies, um, but it's really interesting to see how the industry is growing in terms of having that first-hand experience as well. So let's go ahead and look at the results. That's great to see that there's more than one of the above. Um, it looks like the next most popular is the research studies, white papers, and articles. So I think that this is great, like I said, to see that it's becoming a popular target, but also this is good with, with good reason. We're so used to managing our health around social determinants that we aren't even consciously aware of the impact they have on our health. So I think it's great that we're starting to see this topic arise more. I know I was surprised to learn that one in three deaths in the U.S. annually are related to social factors. The impact is significant. Social isolationism can increase risk of heart disease by 29% and stroke by 32%, and longitudinally, providers have members that have undergone increased isolationism. A member subsector is living in neighborhoods that have barriers to physical activity and access to healthy foods. This has led to a higher likelihood of obesity in these areas. Members who have not had access to higher education are more likely to have shorter life expectancies and higher likelihood of smoking, likely due to having lower health literacy. 
And members go through changes in their lives all the time that create stress. In fact, changes in income, work, and family dynamics are the top three causes of stress, and stress drives 75 to 90 percent of primary care visits. The impact of social determinants of health are staggering, as these statistics show, but knowing that is only part of the battle. The real challenge is leveraging every data point available into not just a more comprehensive view of a member, but also a more comprehensive plan of care outreach. We like to say that social determinants of health are the X factor needed to identify who needs help and how to help them achieve optimal results. What we mean by this is that what you can learn from claims data alone is not a comprehensive picture of the individual. The environment in which a person lives impacts their likelihood to develop health conditions as well as their likelihood to effectively manage those conditions. Care recommendations need to be a good fit for a member's environment, not just their medical condition. If recommendations won't work within the person's physical environment, aren't affordable or conveniently located, and are provided in a way that is hard for the member to understand, they won't be effective at improving health. With only claims data on individuals, you may also be missing opportunities to intervene before a condition develops or worsens. Social determinants of health provide that view into otherwise hidden risks. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services recognizes areas of social determinants of health via healthypeople.gov. We'll review four of those areas along with key data about a person available through our vast public record sources at LexisNexis that can indicate their health risk based on that social determinant. The first social determinant area is called social and community context. You saw the statistic before. Social isolation can increase risk of heart disease by 29% and stroke by 32%. Data such as voter registration information can be indicative of how involved a person is in their community. Information on how close a person's nearest relative lives can provide insight into their support network. Other information on crimes, accidents, and sporting licenses can also indicate how a person is involved in their community. Economic stability is also a social determinant category. Through information on a person's address stability, assets, and financial history, it's possible to determine if the person is likely to have financial challenges. This is important to know, not to limit a person's access to medical care based on ability to pay, but to help them address these challenges. Low income is a major contributor to higher incidence and severity of illness and earlier deaths. Many low income people have difficulty paying for health care and medications when they struggle to pay for other essentials, such as housing, food, and utilities. Neighborhood and built environment is also a social determinant area. This means understanding the demographics of the household where the member lives, the type of housing they live in, and crime and income indexes of the area that can provide insight into the environment impacting the member. For example, crime indexes of the individual's neighborhood matter because chronic anxiety about physical safety can have adverse effects on people's metabolism, leading to weight gain and conditions like heart disease and diabetes. They are less likely to be physically active if they don't have access to safe environments. The final area is education. This includes understanding an individual's level of education as well as their areas of study. Individuals with lower education often have lower health literacy, which means poor health-related knowledge and comprehension. This can influence their ability to interpret medication labels and health messages. Studies have also shown they have increased hospitalizations and emergency care, decreased preventative care, and among the elderly, poorer overall health status and higher mortality. Looking at all of these areas of social determinants of health, it's important to understand that no one piece of data is enough to understand an individual. However, by looking at socioeconomic data on various social determinants of health, a picture of the individual emerges that can help personalize care for them. This personalized care is important for reducing expenses and achieving optimal health results. We've talked about the impact of social determinants of health, and we've shown you categories of data that can provide insight into social determinants. Let's now put the two together in a couple examples. We discussed how neighborhood and built environment impacts your health outcomes. Living in a high crime area has been correlated with poor health outcomes because it limits your access to safe environments to exercise outdoors and to buy healthy foods. It also correlates, as you can see in this chart, to lower prescribed medication adherence, possibly because fewer pharmacies are located nearby. Within a single zip code, it's not unusual to see variance in income levels, crime rates, and other factors impacting an individual's neighborhood and built environment. This is why it's important to look at an individual's actual address. By knowing a member lives in one of these areas, healthcare payers and providers can offer services such as having medications delivered via mail or deploying financial assistance programs. This can have an overall positive impact on health outcomes. In our next example, we relate to the economic stability category. As a member's income increases, their number of ER visits typically decreases. 
Along with other attributes such as address stability, assets, and liens and judgments history, it's possible to understand when a member may need additional financial support. However, even as we look at these examples, it's important to realize that no decision on a member should be made in a vacuum based on only one or two attributes. Low income often correlates with poor health outcomes as we see in this chart. However, low income plus college attendance may indicate that the low income is simply a temporary status. In this scenario, the member is actually more likely to attain a better health outcome since education often leads to better career opportunities and a higher future income. The key is to utilize enough socioeconomic data about a member across various aspects of their life, such as the four categories we presented, to get a holistic picture. Eric, would you like to take us through our next polling question? Sounds like we may have lost Eric. So while he's dialing back in, we'll go ahead and go through this next question. So. The next polling question is, how well do you tailor care management and outreach based upon socioeconomic information? The options are, we don't at this time. We use some information to at least get us started. We hire a third party to engage with members based on this information. We're actively incorporating this information into our programs, or none of the above. We'll give you a few seconds to respond. Based on the previous responses, it'll be interesting to see where we're at. So it looks like we, what's winning is we use some information to at least get us started. But what's surprising is that the growing number of we're actively incorporating this information into our programs. So I'll tell you, we asked this poll question a few months ago, and we saw a lot more in the first couple categories than we did towards the end. So it's really exciting to see how many groups are now starting to actively incorporate this information. And as we go on today, will hopefully give you some really great insights into how you can do that further. I think we have Eric back now. So Eric, do you want to take us through? Absolutely. So yeah, I agree. It's great to see that the adoption of these types of data is becoming more and more prevalent. And I'm pleased to see that so many healthcare organizations are focusing on the value of socioeconomic information. You know, I know it can be daunting to figure out just how to use that data. So. So let's discuss how this data might be gathered and leveraged within your existing workflows today. There are various ways today of sourcing uh, socioeconomic data and leveraging the insights to impact your risk stratification uh, and healthcare continuum strategies. For example, modeling attributes can be used in predictive models um, by analytics groups uh, and uh, actuarial organizations inside of your respective organizations. These are particularly useful for organizations that have very specific aspects of health they are looking to predict and, of course, act on. At LexisNexis Risk Solutions, our data and our analytics teams have been studying thousands of these attributes and validating hundreds of these attributes to enable us to offer solutions that can help healthcare organizations better stratify risk and ultimately manage care. Clinical validation is the process of identifying and qualifying specific data uh, against actual healthcare outcomes, such as like readmissions risk, ER visits, medication adherence, and then using claims data to confirm that correlative power. Clinically validated attributes in existing models can help improve your insight and increase your ability to assess risk for your individual members. Though these attributes do not replace the value of claims data, they can be very powerful in the absence of claims data or even as a supplemental data source to more comprehensively understand your individual members. Social determinants of health information only furthers your ability uh, to help prevent complications down the road. The second way of utilizing social determinants of health data is through predictive scores. Health risk, health risk prediction scores provided at the member level can help you leverage these, social, these validated clinical attributes to provide a picture of future risk 
for those that you want to engage and ultimately act upon. Our LexisNexis Risk Health Score predicts an individual's total health care costs over the next 12 months. Our readmissions risk score, which is coming soon, provides the ability to predict the risk of a readmission within the next 30 days. Both socioeconomic attributes and predictive risk scores can be used upstream in your risk stratification processes and modeling or further downstream in your management activities to help streamline care coordination and improve your outcomes. So let's examine how social determinants of health will surface deeper and more actionable insight. As I'm sure most of you agree, in your respective member populations, members can begin to look very, very similar, at least superficially with regards to their clinical and even some of their demographic data. But should they be treated equally? Well, in this first example, when you look at Ruth and Layla, superficially, these are two middle-aged women, both with diabetes and confounding comorbid activities. But when you layer in the socioeconomic attributes, you can see that this picture dramatically begins to change. Considering that Ruth has three bankruptcies, no degrees, resides at a, in a high crime neighborhood, and nearest relative is over 500 miles away, the picture becomes very clear that assigning certain resources and prioritizing Ruth um, may be prudent uh, when you consider that Layla has a very different picture, zero bankruptcies, highly educated, lives in a low crime neighborhood, etc. There are certainly examples as well where we have very little or disparate clinical data for any of our individual members. Our data sets can obviously help prioritize uh, engagement activities for these individuals as well. For Vivian and Alexis, for example, in the absence of clinical data, their socioeconomic health risk scores look very, very different. For Vivian, who scores an 83, she represents a high predictive total cost over the next 12 months versus Alexis. Here again, it might make more sense to allocate resources in terms of uh, accessing health risk assessment data for Vivian or prioritizing resources for engagement and outreach, whereas Alexis, it might make more sense to uh, engage in overall wellness uh, activities. So getting started with new data and new tools does take patience, innovation, and flexibility. It can be challenging to know how to even get started. So before we wrap up today, we will share some high-level recommendations to do just that. Erin, would you like to share the first step in this process? Thanks, Eric. I think the most logical place to start is to determine where in your workflow social determinants of health could be useful. Eric talked about both upstream and downstream implications. What I would ask is where are your problem areas? Do you have a large number of members with medication adherence challenges? Do you feel confident in your ability to predict which members are likely to have the highest cost if they don't receive help now? Are the number of ER visits among your member population up for the year? I would ask you to complete the statement, we would improve health outcomes in our bottom line if we could only better predict who among fill-in-the-blank population was most likely to fill-in-the-blank. So one example would be, we could improve health outcomes in our bottom line if we could only better predict who among our diabetic population was most likely to experience a low-intensity ER visit. Some areas to look at include total costs, hospitalizations, emergency visits, readmissions, pharmacy costs, medication adherence, stress, and motivation to care for one's own health. These are all healthcare outcomes that we have validated our attributes against in terms of their predictive power. You can utilize social determinants to better predict these outcomes for both your overall population or you can start to look at a variety of specific conditions. We recommend you start with evaluating the impact of social determinants in a few key areas and then adapting your risk stratification and care management practices accordingly. Over time, as you expand your use cases, you and your members will reap more benefits. Of course, deciding where to use social determinants is only the first step. Right, Eric? Yeah, that's, that's exactly right, Erin. One of the challenges of incorporating socioeconomic data into predictive models and care management is that there are many ways of getting socioeconomic data, and, and they're just not all equal. So, for example, I hear a lot of organizations that use zip codes or other basic demographic information from EHRs, which can be useful, but it really is a small window into your members' really complex lives. Other organizations surveying members for socioeconomic information face other challenges. The data is not as easy to refresh. 
Uh, it may not be consistently reported, um, and it may not be reliable since it is self-reported. So we recommend organizations look for certain differentiators when gathering their socioeconomic data. For example, they should look for current, comprehensive, and longitudinal data that can be consistently linked to their member populations and provided in a standardized format. Utilizing public and proprietary records can provide exactly this kind of data. We also recognize that not all data correlates to health outcomes. Organizations will certainly want to look for information that has been clinically validated against health outcomes, like you discussed earlier, Aaron, or be prepared to validate that information through their own internal diligence, their analytics uh, and actuarial groups, et cetera. So we believe looking for these aspects in socioeconomic data will best position organizations to achieve the most valuable incomes. Those are all great points, Eric. Of course, you won't really know the value of socioeconomic data until you try it out, which is what you were recommending with the analytics groups, but could really be used by anyone. This brings us to our next step, building or running the predictive models by incorporating the social determinants of health and comparing the results to actual claims or medical data to validate them. To show what an organization can do with information on social determinants of health, I'd like to share what a leading company in the industry called EveryMove found when they used our socioeconomic health scores. Every Move offers a premier engagement solution for employers and health plans that transforms fitness tracking app information into financial incentives for employers and members. Every Move compared LexisNexis socioeconomic health scores based on total cost to actual historic claims data for 5,000 members, and they validated the score's accuracy for overall risk and risk among seven conditions, including diabetes, cancer, cardiovascular conditions, and stage renal disease, musculoskeletal conditions, gastrointestinal conditions, and respiratory conditions. What they found is that members with the top 10% of socioeconomic health scores did in fact have higher risk than average, and the prevalence of chronic conditions was higher among this population. Every move planned to use the scores to identify and engage the right people in health plans to take the right actions and improve overall health. We're seeing that the more organizations use our data to understand social determinants of health, the more they value, the more value that they find. As a healthcare community, we've only just begun to see the benefits from this exploration. Eric, before we talk about the last step, let's ask a final poll question. The question is, what performance metric would your organization most like to address using social determinants over the coming year? The options are financial outcomes improvement, health outcomes improvement, increased member retention, or other. And when I think of financial outcomes improvement, that's decreasing costs, but also working on MLR ratios. Health outcomes is, of course, improving the quality of those health outcomes. And then member retention addresses that point that you made earlier, which is 10% of a population may switch payers. What could you do to decrease that? Let's go ahead and look at the results. Really glad to see health outcomes improvement as the number one. Uh, but the truth is, we asked everyone to tell us which metric they'd most like to address, but we don't really have to choose. Using social determinants of health to improve risk stratification and care management initiatives can help with each of these three areas. Eric, can you tell us more? Yeah, so before Aaron took us through the opportunities from leveraging these socioeconomic attributes, uh, we discussed the facts that health outcomes, financial results, and engagement and retention ultimately uh, indicate that traditional care methodologies are if not missing the mark, at least needing some significant augmenting with these new data sources. So factoring socioeconomics and risk scores uh, into the equation, there certainly are opportunities to improve health outcomes by more accurately surfacing members that require action and provide better care ultimately by incorporating these types of information. And you can certainly improve financial results by reducing claims expenses and improving these health outcomes. These can all lead to uh, medical loss ratio optimization. Perhaps most importantly, we can engage and retain, retain members by providing more personalized care. You know, I recently heard a quote uh, from Riza Lavizo Mornay, the CEO of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, who just simply said, the choices one makes are determined by the choices one has. And that's a pretty powerful observation. I would argue utilizing these social determinants of health to understand what makes up the kinds of choices one has is the approach that can help all of us tailor a more effective, more engaging message 
Um, but it also really equips us to better react to those changes occurring in the healthcare industry that we've discussed earlier. So, so where are we now? Uh, we've explored today how the industry challenges have led to this need to consider new and emerging data sources uh, to give us the insights we need into the lives of our members, creating that 360 degree view. We've explored how social determinants impact health and some of the methods and techniques for utilizing these types of data. We provided ideas on getting started or furthering your existing efforts around incorporating these types of data into your workflows. And that leads us to our question and answer session. Mary, we'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Eric. With the remaining time, we would like to answer your questions. We will begin with those questions received during the presentation. Please do not hesitate to continue to submit questions Using the Q&A box, we will respond to as many as possible. Erin, do you want to start off with the first yeah, question? Yeah, we'll, we'll get started. Um, so this is about getting started. What was the question that you said we should ask ourselves to determine where to begin? Yeah, so I, the question that I pose is where are your biggest problem areas? I think there's a lot of different direction that you can go with social determinants, um, if you think about all the different types of things that you might want to predict. So we posed the question, where is the, you know, your biggest problem area? And what I recommended was that you really look for both the, either looking at an overall population or looking at a subset of a population, like a diabetic population, and then combining that with some kind of health outcome and starting to incorporate social determinants into your models there so that you can start to test against actual claims data where it's going to be the most valuable. Um, it won't necessarily work for every population and every condition, but we did list the eight different health outcomes where we've found value um, through testing our attributes. And so our customers so far that have been going through and doing trials have really found value in being able to just test it in a few key areas figure out how they want to make changes, and then expanding from there. Eric, do you want to get the next one? I do not see the next question. I apologize. OK. Are you seeing providers increasing their focus on social determinants in discharge planning and patient compliance? Yeah, absolutely. So um, it's so important that the more traditional uh, approaches to discharge planning, which are very prescriptive in nature and follow a, a fairly rigid set of guidelines based on current best practices, begin to consider the unique layers of social determinant data that can change dramatically the types of resources that are appropriated to even patients that are discharged with the same discharge diagnoses. So, um, we're hoping to have and see in our predictive risk scores less readmission rates, better quality of care, faster recovery times, et cetera, all correlated to better quality and lower cost. Yeah, that's a great point, Eric. And specifically with discharge planning, we're coming out with a readmission risk score, which has garnered a lot of interest specifically for that reason. If you know where the highest likelihood is to have someone be readmitted, then you can appropriate the, you know, more resources to help them avoid that condition and, and helpfully help them recover more quickly. So Eric, our next question, um, when looking at Ruth and Layla, would your data show what factors made Ruth a higher risk priority than Layla? So I think Ruth and Layla were our yeah, they were our example where we showed some of the attributes. Um, so what we do is we actually provide attributes that can be used um, in predictive models. So what we do is we encourage you to take those. And again, we don't want to look at any one specific attribute, but look holistically at the entire person. And so we encourage people to use those to come up with alerts or different types of risk scores based on those attributes. Um, there are ways to surface kind of categories of risk that is driving it, whether it's, you know, we kind of talked about the high-level categories, whether it's an economic stability issue or things like that. Um, so we're looking to add those to our scores. Um, but I think it does help to sort of look at the different categories of attributes and potentially use that in your predictive models to come up with some of the reasons that are driving those high risks. Okay. 
Our next question, many plans have predictive modeling already. Would your product sit on top of that, integrate with it, or would it replace it? Eric, do you want to address that one? Sure, that's a, that's a great question. I, I think the answer is it depends. Um, it can certainly be integrated into your existing models um, to provide additional layers of insight. There are various um, machine learning algorithms and data lakes that run these models, uh, and depending upon your level of sophistication around how you ingest all of these disparate data sources to create your risk stratification models, the socioeconomic layer of data, um, because they are individual level attributes, can be assigned to those individual members inside of those algorithms to help increase and produce greater predictive lift. There's also value in understanding um, once stratification is complete, a further segmentation or stratification process on the back end um, when cohorts may already be identified, what unique care management um, programs or resources might you allocate given the additional insights uh, that you can glean from these individual member level attributes. The caveat there, of course, is as Aaron alluded to earlier in the presentation, you, you do need to be careful about making sweeping generalizations on limited data sets. The, the example of education and finance is a good one, but you can imagine with hundreds of clinically validated attributes, um, you want to be sure that you're doing the due diligence to understand that it truly is correlative, whatever the recipe is of attributes or indicators that you use. Uh, Aaron, would you add anything to that? Yeah, Eric, I think those are all great points, and I think you addressed really the, you know, this data can be integrated with claims data, so in that sense, it kind of integrates with what you already have. Um, it can be used in the absence of claims data, or maybe in some cases, you'll find more value in it, and it can replace it. The other product that I've heard come up is a lot of uh, organizations do surveys uh, with their patients where it's kind of uncomfortable to ask for some of this type of information. And so what we've found is that while it doesn't necessarily replace the need to do an entire survey, it can help um, to be more targeted to some of the questions that are, you know, more related to how they're feeling and, and what they are looking, um, you know, kind of their reaction to the situation. And then all of this kind of like public records available information we can provide ahead of time so that you can ask the patients either more targeted questions or fewer questions. Um, to help save time when you're going through those surveys. So I would think of it not only in terms of how it might make your models more effective, but also how it might make, you know, surveying and things like that with patients more effective. All right, our next question, do you consider race and ethnicity to be a social determinant of health? I think this is a really interesting question. So we don't today integrate race and ethnicity into our scores or into our attributes packages. Um, that's not to say that that type of information doesn't have value in predictions. Uh, it's just not something that we've chosen to integrate. There may be some correlations between race and some of the other categories, um, but primarily we're trying to look at things um, that really are kind of surrounding them in their life, whether it's their support network or things like that. All right, the next question. What recommendations have you provided to clients when trying to identify ROI relative to social determinants? I think this is an interesting one. So we do have some information around uh, specifically what could happen if you were to use our scores compared to like a traditional demographic model. We have found that our scores are more um, accurate than some of the traditional age gender models. So just by being able to improve that accuracy, even if it's just a couple of percentage points, you can actually have huge savings on claims by getting more of the right people um, into that care management program because a lot of times you're just trying to put your very high risk people into the program. So the more of those you can identify, the better off you're going to be. Eric, are there other things that you would want to share on the ROI? Yeah, I, I would just add that even with um, really sophisticated clinically claims-based analytics, deriving ROI models can be difficult. As most people on this call can appreciate, the investment in the data and the analytics is significant. And um, the most senior levels of your respective organizations want to understand if that investment is, is, is paying off. Um, and some of those things are indeed difficult to quantify. 
I would just say that the easiest way to think about ROI when it comes to social determinants of health is probably in the patient engagement space. If we have a better understanding of who we need to target based on the enhanced risk stratification, and we also have a better idea of with what resources to appropriate to those targets, we create efficiencies and, and quality that wouldn't be achieved otherwise. And so if you have the ability to baseline where you've been and the success rate with which you've been able to engage and attain your quality metrics, then you can certainly tie those efficiencies and those quality scores back to financial reimbursement uh, and other quality measures that, that glean uh, a greater or help you attain um, greater greater payment. So I, it's difficult, but, but for all of those reasons, um, it, we, we like to think that you're only augmenting what you're already doing, so it, it, it absolutely helps. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And the other piece of it is because social determinants are so new, Eric and I both realize that trying to figure out where specifically within your workflows it's going to be helpful takes a trial period. So we definitely provide that opportunity to test it um, ahead of time and see where you're going to get the value. And like I said, our customers are varied in terms of where they see their highest problem areas and, and where they want to start. So we're starting to see some very positive results from that and hope to be able to share some of that in the coming months. The next question, do providers and payers feel obliged to reveal to their patients or members their use of this data to drive care and other decisions? And what guidance do you provide to clients? I love this question because we, we get it a lot, but it is a really important one. So I think what is key here is that we would never recommend that you tell a care manager or a provider specifically what a person's attributes are. There's really no reason that they need to know what a person's income is or you know some of the pieces like that. That's why we say use them in models and then pass on the alerts um, and the risk scores to your providers and to your care managers to help them figure out how to better treat the patient, but we certainly don't want to have um, the patient feeling uncomfortable with someone knowing that data. And in fact, by being able to do that ahead of time and not have to ask the patient directly for that information, I think it actually can increase the patient's comfort. Um, there's nothing wrong with revealing to the patient that you're using social determinants. I think the way that we would position it is we want to treat you as a holistic person, not just your medical condition. Um, Eric, are there other things, having worked in the industry, that you would recommend? No, I think that's really well said. The categories that you surface that all of these attributes ultimately align to can certainly serve as higher overarching risk categorizations. So for the purpose of care management, if uh, at the point of engagement someone understands that the risk uh, is attributed to uh, education, it, it may just be an indicator that uh, certain types of resources uh, in order to achieve whatever the goal is, whether it's medication persistence or following certain follow-up care guidelines, that there are resources that might be better associated given that level of insight. Um, so it takes some training, certainly, as you look to incorporate these into your workflows, um, but certainly exercising professionalism and tact around the level of insight that the care manager might have um, and what they ultimately share with the patient, as you mentioned at the very beginning, Erin, is, is critically important. Yeah. Um, so the next question we have is, we look at zip code level data right now. Isn't that enough? So I th we talked about this a little bit before. So within a single zip code, I think there was, um, I'm trying to remember the exact story now, but someone was sharing like within a, you know, a, a set of Chicago zip code, like from city blocks, if you walk six blocks over, it's almost like it's a completely different area in terms of the way that crime rates change and income levels change and things like that. So zip code, I think, is too big a category to really be able to get to that personalized care. I think it has great purposes if you're trying to figure out how to allocate resources or if you're trying to look at market expansion decisions or things like that. But in terms of really getting to personalized care, we actually look all the way down to an individual's actual address when we're providing that type of information. Um, and then we aren't providing the address back, but we are providing data about that area that is very specific to where that individual is located. Um, the other problem with only looking at zip code is I think it ignores some of the influences of those other categories we talked about, like education, economic stability, and social and community context.
All right. Uh, our next question, can you give your definition of social determinants of health one more time, please? So I took this one. It's specifically from the World Health Organization. And I am looking for the specific definition for you now. So while I look that up, I'm going to ask another question for Eric to answer, and then I will get back to that one. So Eric, what is an example of data that's not correlated to social determinants of health? Oh, well, one example is that while knowing how close an individual's nearest relative or associate lives to the patient does correlate to healthcare outcomes, knowing how many of those relatives or associates have registered automobiles would not. So in an analysis of 560 some odd attributes, um, 442 um, that we have in our individual package of attributes uh, at, at, again, at a member level, um, all have positive correlates with the healthcare targets, Aaron, that you described earlier. Great. Thanks, Eric. Um, and I found that answer for you. I wanted to make sure I got it right because it's from the World Health Organization. So the definition that we've been using, again, from the World Health Organization is that social determinants of health are conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age that impact their health. So again, it's looking very holistically at a person through the trajectory of their life. And I think that's important. Um, we actually found that we provide some longitudinal data. So we'll tell you not only what certain attributes of their life look like today, but also what they looked like you know, a year ago or two years ago, because some of those changes are actually have more of an impact on health than just point in time data. So again, that's something that our data science team validated. So I think that goes really well with this definition of, you know, it's where you were born and where you live and where you're aging, looking at that whole point of time. All right. Erin, a great example of, of that would be income data. I think oftentimes when we have high level data, um, zip code level data, we make assumptions about income and, and put people in general categories of upper, middle, or lower class, or even within certain salary ranges. Um, in modeling with those particular attributes, to your point exactly, we found that an income variation of 20%, uh, either way, greater or lower, um, can have greater impacts on some of those healthcare targets that you described. Great. Thanks, Eric. So another one of our questions, is crime broken down into smaller components such as battery, identity theft, et cetera? So in our attributes, we actually don't tell you specifically what type of crime. Um, we do have that information available. If you have a specific use case, you can always reach out to us um, and we, we can talk through that. But what we do is we tend to categorize it into different types of crime. Um, and then we also have derogatory information, but also non-derogatory record information that we can provide. So if you're interested in, in learning more on that, please reach out to us and we can talk through some of the different breakdowns we have. But we don't actually identify the type of crime specifically that occurred so much as we categorize it into different levels. Uh, this is a great question. Is all your data person-specific data, or is some of it inferred or assumed? How do you get data such as nearest relative? So our data is um, person-specific data. Some of it is, you know, modeled in the sense that we have lots of different sources that we're comparing against each other to come up with an answer. Some of it is inferred. Um, but again, it's all based on public records data that we're getting, um, possibly from utility companies or from court records or other government sources. Um, we have over 10,000 different sources of data that comes in. So. A lot of it is calculated um, that is actually accurate. Some of it is, um, you know, assumed. But in general, we are able to get a lot of that data very close to accuracy um, because of the fact that it comes from so many different sources. And we also include uh, data that has uh, what we call GLBA credential data. So it's of a higher quality um, than what you're going to get from traditional marketing attributes. The second part of the data or sorry, the second part of the question, how do you get data such as nearest relative? Um, Eric, do you want to talk a little bit about our, our Lex ID and, and how we link people? Yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy to. So perhaps one small step backwards before I answer that addressly is, uh, before I answer that specifically, is to um, share that LexisNexis as an organization 
Um, it, our pedigree is identity level data, and that pedigree has um, been well entrenched in government, financial, and insurance industries across the country and even globally for years and years and years and years. So in aggregate, there's over 10,000 sources of data um, that we pull together and link to these individual identities for all of the use cases you can imagine inside of those verticals. So while we may be somewhat newer in the healthcare space, it's that same foundation of identity data and integrity that affords us the opportunity to provide uh, this level of socioeconomic insight into your member population. The secret sauce, if you will, is that every single member um, in our database across those 10,000 sources is assigned a unique Lex ID, and that's our proprietary linking technology that essentially equates to what would be a social security number for a patient or a member inside of our database. Because we have all of that data, we're able to understand who the relatives are, who might live in those um, same addresses, et cetera. The ability to cross-reference and link all of that information provides exactly what, what the question asked, which is how do we understand who those relatives might be and, and where they might live? And it's, it's through all of those, those algorithms that we're able to, to bring that data to light. I hope that helps. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, so through having Lex IDs on a large part of the population, we're able to understand where your nearest relatives or your closest associates live and then calculate that distance. Yep. So I know we're getting towards the top of the hour. I think let's take one more question. Um, so why have substance abuse or addictions not been noted in this presentation? I think that's a great question. So um, it definitely does correlate to, you know, like we talked about medication adherence and things like that. I think this is an area that is definitely work looking into. Uh, with social determinants of health and seeing if there is some kind of connection, I suspect that there is. Um, you know, there's so many different conditions out there and, and different illnesses or uh, you know, disabilities, things like that, that we could look at that we, we like to say there's just an endless amount of possibilities. So that is one we definitely, you know, think there is possibility to look into as well. We just haven't done as much analysis around it. Um, but everything I've seen would indicate that that would be a really positive place to try and go and find some predictions. All right, so I know we still have questions. Um, Mary, can we maybe just write those questions down and we can follow up with everyone later? I want to make sure we end on time today. Um, so I just want to thank everyone for the great questions. And just to close out, I did want to remind us that we said we would answer the question overall, where might you be after adopting a social determinants of health insight discipline? The answer is really up to you and where in your workflows you decide to incorporate this information. But we hope whatever you choose, that it will lead to improved care management and risk stratification initiatives that improve not only your organization's financial success, but most importantly, and as you all mentioned in your poll, your members' health and satisfaction. Eric and I really appreciate your time and attention this afternoon, and we look forward to discussions with you as you work to better understand new and existing members through the use of this data. And if you have further questions, our contact information is at the end. Please feel free to contact us, and like I said, we'll try and follow up on these questions that we didn't get to today. This has been a really exciting discussion for us, so thank you. And with that, I will turn it back over to Mary. Thanks, Erin. Thank you, everyone, for your time, and be sure to watch out for our follow-up communication. It will contain the webcast recording, and we will be following up on those questions that we weren't in, not able to answer. So this will conclude today's presentation. Thank you all very much for attending.